This video is intended to take the place of the usual in-person lab tour and basic safety walkthrough for new users of the flexible clean room facility. It is assumed that you have read and understood the general clean room manual and the COVID-19 clean room policies and that you know how to properly gown up following those new policies. You can find the links to the general clean room manual and to the COVID-19 clean room policies down at the bottom of the flexible clean rooms webpage in the getting started section. After getting properly gowned up in the gowning room, you are now ready to enter the clean room. Make sure you are wearing your safety glasses. On the right is a long row of microscopes. The first one on the right end is a brand new, very nice Nikon with sophisticated image processing features. Then there's an old high powered lights microscope, a wild low powered stereo microscope, and an Olympus high powered inspection microscope. Back in this corner of the lab is the flip chip bonder and also the Loctite UV exposure tool for doing blanket exposures and UV curing of optical adhesives. There's also a digital scale right here. In the same room across from the microscopes is the plasma asher. The plasma asher uses an oxygen plasma to clean off organic residues and dry etch organic films. Many of our users also use it for chemically modifying the surface of PDMS or other polymers to help with bonding operations. An oxygen plasma also increases the wettability of surfaces prior to spinning polymers or resists for better adhesion. Next to that is a vacuum oven, which we mainly use for degassing epoxies and PDMS. This is the rapid thermal annealer used for annealing ohmic contacts. And this is the reflow chamber to solder stacked chips after flip chip bonding. We have many of these Blue M convection ovens in various locations throughout the lab. Now we're going to move on to the next room, which we call the yellow room. The windows and doors are yellow to avoid exposing photoresist. This is where photolithography is done, and it's where the wet benches are located. Someone is working here now, so we'll come back to this room later. The next room down is where the sputter station and ion mill are located. The labeled Univex 400 sputter station has three three-inch sputter guns. Two guns are for DC sputtering of metals and one gun for RF sputtering of dielectrics and metals. On the left is a probe station for general testing. And then down at the end of this room is the ion mill. The ion mill uses a beam of argon ions to directionally etch away any material. The sample mounting stage rotates for uniformity and can be tilted to optimize the desired sidewall profile. Facing the sputter station is this cabinet where we store miscellaneous flammable liquids and solvents. But the more commonly used solvents are stored in a larger cabinet in a service chase behind the solvent bench. If you fill up a wastebasket, here is where the spare trash can liners are located. Over here under the window is the vacuum bag sealer, which can be used with or without vacuum. The bags are stored on a shelf under the bench. It is operated by a foot switch down below. If you run out of clean room wipers in one of the dispensers, this is where the packs of wipers are stored. On this post is where the fire extinguisher is, is mounted. There's also another bigger fire extinguisher in the gowning room in the corner right by the exit. And down here near the end of this hallway is where the profilometer is located. To the left of it is a general use computer used for making badger entries, etc. This last room is mainly just for use by the lab manager for doing microfab shop work. Please don't touch anything in this room without permission. The profilometer uses a diamond stylus to measure step heights such as measuring the thickness of photoresist or thin films, or for measuring the depth of an etched trench after ion milling or wet etching. Now let's head back to the yellow room. This is the ML3 direct write machine. This is a maskless way of exposing patterns into resist. You design the pattern using a mask design software such as Cluin, 
and then it writes that pattern directly onto the resist. On the bench to the left of it is the Olympus microscope. This microscope has a yellow filter for the light source so that you can look at resist features without exposing the resist. Across the aisle from the MO3 is the Quintel mask aligner. Normally you will need a glass or quartz mask to use this. However, some people working with SU8 use this using homemade laser written transparency masks. In the right rear corner is the safety shower and eye wash station. Make sure that the path to this is always clear. Also make sure that the checkered outline on the floor is clear. Also over here is an explosion proof refrigerator used for storing things such as temperature sensitive resists and adhesives. To use the eye wash fountain, lean on the paddle to the right. Use your fingers to hold your eyelids open and flush your eyes out thoroughly. To use the safety shower, pull on the ring. Both of these dump on the floor, so only use these in an actual emergency. The floor is not drained. Now we'll move on to the acid bench. This sink and the other two sinks in this room provide 18 mega ohm deionized water. Only non corrosive, non toxic things such as water or dilute detergent should go down the drains in these sinks. There are also DI water guns located in sunken wells near each sink in this room. And there are nitrogen guns at both ends of every wet bench in this room. We provide many of the common acids, such as phosphoric acid, hydrochloric acid, nitric acid, sulfuric acid, hydrofluoric acid, as well as some common etchants, such as BOE, chromium etchant, gold etchant, etc., which are stored in the rollout drawers below. Small quantities of most acid waste that you generate can be disposed of in the cup sinks at the back of the bench. This one is for HF mixtures and for buffered oxide etch. And this is for most other acids and etchants that don't contain HF. The brown bottle is for the disposal of small quantities of sulfuric and peroxide mixtures otherwise known as piranha. The cup sinks drain into five gallon carboys in a cabinet in the service chase behind the bench. When the carboys are three quarter full, a white warning light lights up on this panel on the head casing above. When the carboy is full, a red light lights up and a loud alarm sounds off. A valve closes under the carboy to keep you from adding more and keep you from overflowing the carboy. If this happens, please don't add any more waste to the cup sink. Put a note over the cup sink that it is full and notify the lab supervisor that the carboy needs to be replaced. To turn off the annoying alarm you can push the alarm silence button. That button will blink red. Once the carboy has been replaced we can hit the alarm reset button to have the system work normally again. In this slim drawer under the acid bench you'll find safety information for working with HF, some magnetic spinner bars, and also the manual for the wet bench. Up on top of the acid bench's head casing are 9x9 clean room wipers and HF burn cream. If you suspect you may have come into contact with HF, you would first rinse the area thoroughly with water. The burn cream draws fluorine ions out of your skin while you're waiting for proper medical care. There is a sunken magnetic spinner hot plate hidden under this panel in the corner of the bench. The power to this hot plate is on a timer. It was originally set to 8 hours, but because a few people were using it to do long electroplating jobs, we increased the setting to 48 hours. You need to push this button to start the timer before using the hot plate. The controls for the hot plate and spinner are on the hot plate itself. Make sure the hot plate is totally cooled down before replacing the cover. There are several general use timers above each wet bench, used for timing etches or for timing developer in the base bench. There are also these magnahelic gauges, which are used as a way of confirming that there is proper airflow through the bench. Normally they should read between 0.7 and 1. Every once in a while the building's fire sensors erroneously sense smoke in the exhaust ductwork. If this happens, dampers in the exhaust system fully close, which causes the flow to drop to zero. So I installed these alarms and bright red warning lamps in each bench warn users of the dangerous loss of airflow. If this happens, 
You should leave the lab immediately while we wait for the HVAC guys to reset the computer which handles the exhaust extraction system. There is a large red kill switch up at the upper right corner of each wet bench. If you have some kind of emergency in the bench, you can just push this button and it will kill the power to the entire bench, such as turning off hot plates or anything that, that you're worried about. If you have any of your own chemicals that you want to store in the lab, you should talk to the lab supervisor about it before you even order them, just to make sure they're acceptable for use in this lab. All chemicals must be labeled with the following information. The name of the chemical with no abbreviations, the hazards of the chemicals, your name, and please don't use your group's name, and the date that you brought the chemical into the lab. The base bench has a layout similar to the acid bench. This is where you will be doing all water-based developing, as well as working with alkaline etchants such as sodium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide, or ammonium hydroxide. All base waste goes into the base waste cup sink at the rear of the bench. Never work with any solvents at either the base or acid benches because the solvents will dissolve the material that the bench is made from. The hot plate timer for the base bench is set at 8 hours. This is just so that it will turn off automatically if you forget to turn it off at night or something. To the right of the base bench, there's a couple of Blue M convection ovens. And there's a pass-through for shuttling chemicals from the service chase to the yellow room. Also over here is where we store full face shields and chemical aprons. Now we'll move on to the solvent bench. There is a carboy collection system for waste solvents, but I added an extender tray to make it easier to pour waste solvent into it, or for use when rinsing off parts with a squeeze bottle. We provide acetone, 2-propanol, methanol, and n which is a strong degreaser solvent. If you need to do any solvent-based developing, such as when developing SU8, you would do that in this bench. If you use up the solvent in one of the squeeze bottles, you can find gallon bottles in the small yellow cabinet to the left where you can refill the squeeze bottle. If you can't find the solvent you need, there are more bottles in the tall cabinet in the service chase behind the solvent bench. That service chase is dirty, so it would be better if you asked the lab supervisor to put one of the bottles that you need in the pass-through. On top of that small cabinet is a roll of heavy-duty aluminum foil, which is mainly used to line the spinner with to make cleanup easier. Behind that roll of foil is one of the three phones within the clean room, along with a laminated card with emergency contact information. Every phone in the lab has one of these laminated cards next to it. Under this panel is a hidden ultrasonic bath. There should always be at least an inch of water in it to keep the transducers from overheating. Your parts would normally go in a beaker full of solvent or detergent solution, which you would place into the ultrasonic bath. If the water level is too high, there is a drain valve down in front of it that drains very slowly. If you need to raise the water level, use the DI water gun to fill it. When you're done using the ultrasonic cleaner, put the uh, plastic cover over the tank and put the stainless steel cover back over it. Now we'll move on to the spinner bench. Usually if you're going to be spinning something, you'll be baking it on a hot plate afterwards. So it's a good idea to set the temperature on the hot plate before you start spinning. I designed and built this triple hot plate unit that sits on the left end of the bench. After turning on one of the hot plates, you'll need to set the temperature. To set it, push one of the up or down keys until the green set point starts blinking. Then use the up or down keys to enter the temperature you want it set for. After a few seconds it will stop blinking and start slowly ramping up to that temperature. Please make sure your gloves are clean and dry before touching these controls or any other controls in the lab. Solvents will dissolve the touchpad keys. Wafers coated with most normal resists can be placed directly on the hot plate. But for things that are difficult to remove once they're hardened, like SU8, you should use these little sheet metal trays to put them on the hot plate so you don't mess up the surface of the hot plate. This is the headway spinner. Uh, to the left of it is a stand full of various chucks to use on the spinner. The controls for the headway are up above and the head casing. A foot switch on the floor is used for stopping and starting the spinning process. You will need to be trained separately on this spinner before using it.
These are the chucks that we provide. We also provide AZ1512 photoresist, which is a good general purpose positive photoresist. And in these bins to the right are some disposable plastic pipettes, which we use to dispense the photoresist. When you're done using the spinner, you'll probably have some foil and wipers with photoresist or acetone on them. You should take that waste and put it in the Ziploc bags, which are up on top of the cabinet. And then the sealed Ziploc bag goes into this yellow dumpster, where it is disposed of as hazardous waste. These doors, as well as any of the other doors in the lab that go out to the hallway, can be considered emergency exits. Before leaving the yellow room, make sure you have left the countertops clean and dry. Put away any of your belongings in a plastic toolbox with your name on it. Don't leave anything on the counter when you are done. If you need to let something soak in an etchant or in solvent, be sure to leave a note stating your name, what's in the beaker, the dangers of it, and when you'll be returning. Sometimes people leave beakers to sit out to dry and then they usually forget all about them and they sit there for days or weeks. So when that happens, I usually take them and put them in this big white plastic bin that's just outside of the yellow room. Behind that bin are a bunch of empty bottles that I keep around just in case we need them for getting rid of some hazardous waste. Near the exit of the lab, to the right of it, there's a cabinet where we keep a lot of supplies such as uh, disposable Petri dishes. Most tools in the lab require some additional training, so before you use any new tools for the first time, please contact the lab supervisor for training. Thanks for watching. Thank you.